Joining us now, Canucks reporter, one half of the rink I deal with, Andrew Wadden, and boy, they were busy this weekend, Mr. Jeff Patterson. How you doing? <laughs> I'm all right, yeah. There was a lot going on, and uh, that included two games, but those seem like such a, yeah. a distant memory and such an afterthought now. But uh, yeah, there was a couple of games, a couple of post-game pods, and sure, why not? One more a yeah. bonus pod on a Sunday as well. Yeah, I'm not sure the uh, the games or the opponents will be remembered uh, after this weekend. No, What's but they, that- are, they, they are a relevant uh, backdrop here, guys. The games are because um, they wanted to win those games for Bruce. They couldn't. And, yeah. it, and it is proof of the task ahead for Rick Tockett in that I think they did kind of give their best, particularly the last game. I think they were a little bit floored, as Tyler Myers put it, uh, in the penultimate game. Um but they tried. They're not a very good team. And it's going to be a tough assignment for Rick Tocca to turn this group around. Yeah. And, and Friday, you're right. I mean, it was clear. Like, they were going through the motions against the Avs. Saturday, I think they played hard third period. There was a bit of a push there. And I yeah. do think that they they recognized the moment and, and fed a little bit off uh, the love for Bruce. Uh, that said, I mean, look, don't for a second think that this wasn't so calculated with the timing uh, that the coaching change coincides with the end of his 12-game gauntlet to the point that Bruce himself, before he's even fired, you know, Bruce didn't push back an awful lot, but there were a couple of subtle digs, and that was one of them where he referenced he was forced to run this gauntlet of 12, and they they won two of them, and then the new coach comes in, and all of a sudden there is this soft launching pad of Chicago. Uh, Seattle won't be easy, but Columbus at the end of the week, and and really you look at the remaining schedule for Rick Uh, 14 in the final 36 are against teams that are 23rd in the league or worse. And, you know, that puts them right there in the company of the Vancouver Canucks. So uh, it's going to be a slog. But as I pointed out on Twitter last night, with Arizona's win over Vegas, since Christmas, the Canucks are dead last. So the people that believe that they can continue to fall, uh, 13-game stretch at the very least, Canucks are dead last in the National Hockey League. And they directly the affect. If you hold, give points to those teams, that will. those are four-point games in the, yeah. in the positive. You can give, you can float the boat for Arizona if you lose to them going forward. And, and I don't dispute that the schedule gets easier and that the gauntlet is over. But, A, there are no easy games for this team when you're this Fair bad. Fair enough. Yeah. Particularly with this goaltending. And, of course, you are likely to be even weaker once you make a Bo Horvat and or Luke Shen. And perhaps he's an, even an Andre Kuzmenko like, trade. But so, Caulfield shut like down, if, Norris if, if, shut if, down. Sure. You know. And I guess what I would say is, you know, if the master plan was to set up Rick Tockett to have some success in the final third of a season that's going nowhere, I'm not sure it is worth the cost and what you've done to the brand and to your own personal reputations with the events of also, this Also, it doesn't weekend. fit the long-term vision. Well, no, but I will say this. If they had decided to pull the plug on Rick Tockett at any point during the gauntlet, he was going to suffer the fa- same fate that Bruce did, and I think it would have just, fan the fan base would have said, like, why? Like, Bruce could have lost those games as easily right. as the new coach. Like, yes, why? Yeah. Well, and so yeah. I think it was really quite a clear demarcation point. Again, I always thought they could get to the week off here a week from now <laughs> and kind of make a clean break then, but I think they had this in their mind uh, for a while, although we were told that this was all... Uh, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Just decided. <laughs> just oh, yeah. decided. Just, yeah. He happened to be sitting there in Vancouver, yeah. you know. Uh, I guess he hot the made. red eye. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, let's ask this. So, you know, the message points coming out of the press conference uh, vis-a-vis the coach is he's got to get more out of the bottom third of the roster. He's got to fix the penalty killing, and he's got to get more out of the young players like Pud Coulson and Hoaglander when they eventually get called back up. Is all of that so situation critical to you, Jeff, that, again, that it is worth the trauma of what you put your fans, your players, and everybody through with the Boudreaux goodbye? Uh, there were a number of things. I mean, it was a fascinating press conference. There's been a lot of talk in the last week. I mean, it was this day last week that Jim Rutherford spent 45 minutes addressing medical issues and then the broader issues plaguing the hockey club. And then, you know, not even a week later, he's back at the at the dais and, and another 45 minutes. So they've covered a lot of topics, but a lot of topics had to be covered. And what I heard from Rick Tockett yesterday, uh, it's fine. Like, I mean, he, I thought... He, He handled himself all right. Uh, You know, we know what he was like as a player, and I think that he coaches along. You know, he's a no-business, no-nonsense kind of guy. Um, And Bruce does have to wear some of the statistical evidence that the team uses against him. I mean, 31st in goals against penalty kill that is 32nd and getting worse, it seems, by the the game. 
Uh, and there was just nothing that was ever done to change that. And so I did find it fascinating to hear about the two meetings where they sort of, you know, laid down the law to Bruce, said, we'll check back in in a couple of weeks. If there's not improvement, you know, look out. And sure enough, in a couple of weeks, you know, I think it is goals against and, and penalty kill and some of those things that just showed no improvement whatsoever. And, you know, the management group would say, hey, we gave him ample warning here. But, I mean, it was so evident to everybody that uh, this just was never this group's coach. He just, he wasn't. And to hear Jim Rutherford again refer to Bruce as a, a friend yesterday, like it just rings so hollow when you think of the way that this guy was dragged. Uh, not just in the past week. I mean, it got amplified in the last week, but really uh, his tenure as head coach of the Vancouver Canucks. And we know that, you know, one of the reasons he was brought back was because they knew that they couldn't win the PR war if they fired him in the offseason after he did what he did over those 57 games. And so uh, it just kind of felt like a matter of time. So for Rick Tockett, you know, a couple of things I heard. Uh, I was surprised to hear him drop the Desmond Tutu reference about eating elephants. But, uh, you know, so be it. <laughs> Whatever. You know, uh, everybody, Bruce said win the week. His thing was uh, bite by bite. Alvin apparently is brick by brick. Um, I think Tockett understands what he's getting himself into and the work that he's got in front of him. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of tactical and lineup decisions he makes that will differ from Bruce, uh, scaling off some of his top players where he said he just don't think he can play them 24 minutes a night and that he wants them to be as fresh as possible to attack. So uh, that's fine. But if you take Elias Pettersson off your penalty kill, like the penalty kill is already bad with Pettersson, but I, he, I think he's shown signs of, you know, being able to do the job to some degree. Like I, I think, you know, all right, take Patterson off the penalty kill, but Jack Stonika, is that who's going to, like, who are we talking about in this sort of the bottom third that needs to play more? Uh, I would agree that guys in the bottom third need to do a little bit more. I mean, Curtis Lazar has gone 26 games without a point, and Dakota Joshua has gone 18 games without a a goal. Earlier in the season, Joshua you know, looked like a nice find, but, boy, he has uh, kind of cooled off. Um you know, Will Lockwood, if you want to give him more time on the penalty kill, I'm, I'm fine with that. But there just isn't a whole lot there in the bottom third. Uh, and especially with Hoaglander and Pod Colson down on the farm. Now, Rutherford was quick to jump and said, oh, yeah, they're going to be back. And then Elvin walked that one back and admitted that when it was time that they would earn their way. And then you would see what they learned down in Abbotsford. So uh, pretty clear to me that they have no choice but to make Vasily Pod Colson the penalty killer the next time that yep. he arrives here, that that is something that has to happen in the short term and the long term. But quite frankly, if they want to see less of their top end guys and more of the bottom end, like I don't know who they're talking about. And I honestly, I don't know. Do they want to see more because they believe there's more there? Or I think Rutherford sort of alluded yeah. to it. Do they want to see more to prove to themselves that there really isn't enough there and that they'll have to go out and find uh, replacement players at some point? I, I mean, I think they f probably feel like they're right on Oman, on Joshua, and that they need to see more out of the youngsters. Uh, uh, and so I, I, I interpret it as positive, you know, with regards to potential still, as opposed to uh, let's make sure these guys can't play. And, you know, Jeff, I'll say this. Um, Rick Tockett and Archbishop Tutu, one of these things is not like the other, <laughs> but Canuck Nation could use a whole lot of truth and reconciliation these days if we're going to follow the Archbishop's example going forward with the franchise. Yeah, yeah again, tastes like chicken, by the way. I don't know what I needed to hear from Rick Tockett. It was an introductory press conference. Uh, he's going to be judged by the decisions he makes, and he's got his hands full on a team that uh, obviously uh, hasn't done nearly enough winning. I, I thought Rutherford, again, I mean, it was funny to hear him say, I got to zip it. Uh, I, I think it's in his nature. Uh, he can say that. I, I think he's going to have trouble keeping it zipped. But whatever the case, uh, you know, he started down the road of an apology, and I thought good for him, and I wish he had just you know, full stop. Just leave it there as an apology to Bruce and the fan base, but then to throw it back at uh, everybody and blame it on the circumstances and, you know, this was beyond their control and all that kind of, like... Couldn't no, have done just, it differently, right? Just Couldn't stop. have done it just, any. Yeah. yeah. Like, sometimes you have to eat the, the big slice of humble pie, and nobody seems to want to do that uh, with this front office and just take full ownership of the way things have gone down here for the last little while. Uh, the, the, I didn't think a lot was made or enough was made of Patrick Aldean's performance yesterday because, A, we haven't heard from him in a long, long time. Uh, the last time we did was after hours, and that was a total flop of a performance. And I thought Patrick Aldean tried to assert himself yesterday. I thought there was more 
sort of forceful attempts from Patrick Alvin than we have ever seen. And some of that came after Rutherford said, I'm going to zip it. I'm going to let Patrick do the talking. But the very first words out of his mouth when he said, you know, I decided this morning to make a change. And I thought that was sort of him pounding the desk like I am. I'm the captain now. Uh, I'm in charge here. Um, and then as it went on, I'm not sure he did himself a lot of favors, quite frankly. There were a couple of long-winded answers where he sort of talked himself in circles, and he had me for a while, and then he lost me. But this whole notion of the question was about the fan base and repairing the, the damaged, fractured relationship with the fans, and you know he points to the ceiling and talked about the rafters and the banners, and that's fine. There is not a Stanley Cup banner. And yes, that has to be the goal for everybody. But when he got around to talking about setting a culture it's important to remember, Patrick Alvin has been on the job one year, this week, one year. Uh, last January, he came in. And for a guy that talked an awful lot about setting the culture, uh, a fired employee has filed a human rights complaint against the hockey club. The players called up the medical staff to the point that they had to call a press conference a week ago to address that very thing. And then you've dragged a head coach who uh, a didn't deserve it. Uh, yeah, drove a, a 68-year-old man to tears in front of uh, you know his adoring fans and a television audience. There's a lot of work to do about setting the culture, and so you know just turning the page from one coach to another. Uh, the culture is, goes beyond the guy behind the bench. I mean, it is organizationally wide, and and I think that uh, he has to be careful to come out there and sort of. It felt like a little bit of a finger wag at anybody that wanted to question the work that's been done here. Uh, I'm not so sure that they've taken the necessary steps to instill the kind of culture that's going to lead them where they, they want to go. Well listed off there, Jeff, and, and it's a great answer. And and he clearly had that talking point in front of him about the culture and the banner because then he was asked, okay, okay, enough of that. What about the tangible rebuild or, or build, if whatever you wanted to call it? What's the plan? Like, How do you get better? And he just came back to the banner, came back to the culture again. He never really answered how he's going to change this team at all. And what it seemed like he only had that talking point. And and to me, that's where he lost it. It's one thing to bring up culture in, you know, despite uh, the laundry list of things that counter that, like you, like you mentioned, but a good aspirational goal to have the culture thing, but there's no tangible hockey goals that he outlaid outlined. No. Now, the one area I do want to give the organization credit, and he was clear to put this forward, is Abbotsford and the player development. And it does feel like from day one, they recognize that what's going on in this organization, Utica and Abbotsford combined, uh, not enough. This is a Pittsburgh group that used Wilkes-Barre an awful lot to, you know, advance the careers of players so that they got to the NHL and helped the, the big league team. And I do think they've got some good things going in Abbotsford. And I think the Sedins have spent a lot of time out there this year. So credit to them for, for making the commute and, you know, being hands-on there. I think Jeremy Colleton deserves the credit that he's getting. I think he is the right guy for, for that job in the here and now. And so you want to believe at least that's one area of the operation that it's not going to provide instant dividends, but, just the fact that they did send Pud Colson and Hoaglander and them on and Rathbone down there. Uh, and it does feel like those guys have taken steps forward. So, uh, you know, I think that they can be part of what the Canucks are trying to build here, uh, brick by brick, step by step, whatever it is. Uh, but they're not here right now. And so it's fine to talk about, you know, what they might do when they get back here, but it doesn't sound like they're going to get the instant recall. And so that's where this organization has to move forward with 36 games remaining, uh, they are going to get worse before they get better because they are going to strip away the captain, Shen, Kuzmenko. Uh, maybe they can work a deal for one of those other players, uh, whether it's Garland or Besser or somebody else. Brock Besser's the guy, to me, guys, like he got the Bruce bump. Like He was down at the time of uh, Travis Green's firing. He had four goals, 25 games into last season, and he got the Bruce bump right away. Like Talk about a guy who was going through all of the personal heartache with his father and you know, he knew what we didn't at that time was just how, how serious it was for his dad. And, I mean, clearly it was weighing on him, but Bruce came in and was the right guy for the job. And I don't think there was a player on that Canuck roster that got a bigger Bruce bump than Brock Besser, who needed a hug at that point. Like the guy, just yeah. as a human being, he needed a hug and Bruce is a hugger. <laughs> yeah. I don't get the sense of the talk it is. And 
So I'm curious to see, because it hasn't gone particularly well again this year for Brock Besser. Uh, we know that the agent's out there shopping. He still remains a member of the Vancouver Canucks that probably has to tell you uh, a little bit about uh, you know the trade market for that player and the contract he's got. I'm curious to see if this is about tough love and doing whatever Bruce you know wouldn't do or didn't do. That's a guy that I, I – how does he respond uh, this is his fourth head coach. He's been, you know, six full years in the in the Canucks organization, and he's on his fourth head coach now. Um, you know, that's tough. That that's got to be tough. But I, that's the one guy. Like I think Elias Pettersson is a star of the making. I think he's so driven. Uh, you know, he probably doesn't want his ice time scaled back, but I, I think he'll just keep doing what he's doing. But if there's one guy that I wonder about a little bit, uh, it is Brock Besser and how is he going to respond? Obviously, OEL. Yeah. We know that the Tockett tried to downplay that one. Uh, Connor Garland has uh, played under Tockett before and had some success when he broke into the league under that coach. But uh, you, you always you get guys to get the new coach balance, but you also get guys that sort of fade the other direction. Uh, Besser is one guy that I'm kind of curious to see uh, how it all works for him here. Yeah, and you wonder uh, whether between now and the trade deadline, based on what Tockett thinks, whether the Canucks might finally just go, you know what, let's just get rid of Brock and let's use the six point six million other ways we don't necessarily need anything in return or uh let's just move on and use the cap space more effectively going forward. Let's ask you the Bodog poll question. Jeff, I don't want to age you my friend, but um he is so youthful looking, but he is nearly as old as the Vancouver Canucks in the NHL. Is this the lowest point in their history. I would say in the treatment of one individual, it has to be. I just, I, I mean, I, you're right. Like I, I have sort of racked my brain and it, you know, it hasn't ended well for a number of guys, but that's pro sports, but this was different. It, it looked and felt different. And just the, the national, uh, dare I say international, at least league wide attention that all of this got, you know, on top of all of the losing, and the fact that this is three head coaches in a 13-month span, yeah, I mean, this has to be on a very short list. Obviously, the Keenan Messier days, uh, that was a dark period, too. I pointed it on Twitter. Like, it would have been fascinating to see the Bill LaForge 20 games as head coach where he won four of them in yes. a social media age. Yes. Like, I just, <clears throat> to me, you know, a Petri Scrico meme wasn't a thing back then, but there would have been many. <laughs> um, but, you know four wins in the first 20 games you hire a new coach and he doesn't get past the 20 game mark that's pretty dark too and that was three years removed after their first run to the the stanley cup final that's the amazing thing about this organization is you look at the low points and you know 82 they get to their first stanley cup final three years later we're talking about bill LaFords getting hired and fired within 20 games 94 they get to the stanley cup final three years later it's keenan and messier and obviously in 2011 you know, they backed it up with another President's Trophy in 2012, but the year after that, they get swept by the Sharks with home ice advantage. Like, just how quickly the mighty fell uh, in the few times that they have been, you know, at or near the top of the National Hockey League. Yeah, uh, no doubt. A uh, terrible fall from grace. We've experienced that. We've also experienced great characters in the head coaching office, and uh, boy, Bruce stands with all of them and might be the most beloved uh, on his way out the door because of the way it ended. Uh, lastly, for me, Jeff, we have seen more slings and arrows pointed at ownership here in the last week or so than I think I can ever remember. Do you think this is an inflection point? Do you think this is the moment where the market is saying we're no longer going to stand for Aquilini ownership? Or do you think, like many other issues with this ownership group and this owner personally, um, it just gets swept under the rug and people flock back to the rinks and support Canucks hockey uh, irrespective. Yeah, I, I don't see an awful lot changing in terms of uh, any sort of want on the part of the Aquilini family to get out of the business. Uh, it would be fascinating at some point. I mean, we never hear from Francesco, and this year particularly, even on Twitter. I mean, he's gone uh, radio silent there. So who knows? Uh, but we also know that uh, he and the family are pretty sensitive, that uh, whether they respond and react, they hear uh, an awful lot of what's going on. But we've seen the hashtag sell the team for a while now. Uh, I, you know, I, I do think it deep down, it, it, somewhere in the pit of their heart, uh, you know, there is a love for this organization. They do want to see this through to the finish line. It's just that none of their actions uh, make you think that they get it and will be able to you know, produce the Stanley Cup. 
uh, under their ownership. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not anticipating that this is any sort of change. I am, you know, season ticket renewals, like we always talk about that. The tickets for this year are pretty much sold. So I don't know that you're really going to be able to gauge, you know, the, the bottom line impact on what you see in the stands. Although anecdotally, I'm hearing from like just friends of mine that are ticket holders that are having trouble giving tickets away right now. And that is, you know, when people don't want to consume your product for free, uh, you know, that says something because it's still a night out, uh, you know, this week alone. You had Stamkos, you had McKinnon, you had McDavid. Like, if forget the Canucks, you have the best of the best coming through your building if it's just a night out in entertainment. And people are saying, nah, I'm good. Uh, you keep those tickets, try and give them to somebody else. I don't want them. You know, that says something, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the, the thing I would love to have heard Jim Rutherford say yesterday was, we get it, we messed up, we hope that we are not in a position to have to make these kinds of decisions for a long, long time, and that you know we can now get on with the business of building this back up. And and again, there was a mea culpa about the way he handled Bruce, but then he turned it around and, and tried to play the blame game. I, I personally, like whether I cover this team or having been born and raised in Vancouver, I, enough with the noise. Like I, I just hope now that they have turned the page to a new coach that the volume around this team uh, lowers, that they can just be our team to nitpick and that the rest of the league will leave them alone. Uh, but, I mean, look, the Horvat deal's front and center, so, like, they're not going away, at least not before the trade deadline. Once the trade deadline comes, then maybe people will start to focus more on playoff-caliber teams and playoff races and those types of things. But, you know, it's just one, jumping from one crisis to another now and all the focus. Uh, forget Rick talking behind the bench. Yeah, he's the head coach, but the focus now is how does this team – negotiate the Bo Horvat situation, and do they get it right? Because they clearly didn't get it right when it came to handling imagine, their coach. Imagine a poor return in the trade of a beloved captain. Oh, my yep. goodness. Yeah, they do no. have to get it right. There you go. Uh, might be a lower point yet. Yeah. Uh, Jeff's going to be very busy here over the next little while, and mm-hmm. uh, we're lucky to have your expertise to draw on. Thank you, my friend. We'll catch up Wednesday. All right, guys. Thanks.